Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Probably a little bit better than me. I'm not good. I'm not good, man. Look, commitment. To the, fair play to all the international Reds. One day of it and I'm complaining about it. Yes, I stayed up to watch the Wrexham game. Yes, United lost 3-1. You would have already seen my match reaction. We can speak about it a little bit in the comments as a community this morning. And we will speak about Rasmus Hoyland and Sofian Amrabat. The two, it looks like. The two main transfers that hopefully Manchester United will complete between now and the end of the summer transfer window. We've obviously got Mount and Onana. If we get Mount, Onana, Hoyland and Amrabat, I think a lot of United fans will say it's a very good window. But obviously there's still more to talk about. We'll speak about West Ham <laughs> and a 45 million price tag on McTominay. I always thought it was worth more than people were going to say. But 45 million, whew, that, is, um, that is a commitment. We'll speak about that. We'll speak about all the other exits. Anthony Langer to Nottingham Forest. We'll speak about the game we've got in less than 20. What? Sod knows how many hours now. Real Madrid again tonight. The big one. Andrea Nana's debut. Oh, I'm looking forward to that game. I really, really am. But who is in the comments from the community? Uh, good morning to all the members. We've got Jonesy. We've got Kev Ryan. Brian. Um, no, I can't skip the boring intro. I apologize about that. <laughs> Natasha Innes. Good morning to you. Ned. Uh, Mikel, we've got Robert, we've got Mo, Andy, Sam, Emba, Sylvester, Philip, Josh, you're there, Ant, you're there, T, you're there, I think, Stu, good morning to you, Saeed, who's on Facebook, let's have a look, we've got David Collette, good morning to you, James Bander, Robert Withers, and Sean Carly, I don't know why I'm doing that for, but look, let's get into the show, boy, yeah, you know, I didn't do, it was an enjoyable first 15 minutes yesterday. It was an enjoyable first 15 minutes. And I said it in my um, my sort of match preview. I said the absolute main thing that we all need to be looking out for in this game is, does this under-21s team just look like a younger, less polished version of a Ten Hag team? That's what I wanted to see. And honestly, if you watch the first 15 minutes, yeah. Really good in possession, in tight scenarios, under pressure, building out from the back, good pressing from the front. Hannibal leading the press. Really, really good performance from Hannibal. I think in pretty much every game he's played so far, he's played well. I'll speak about him. I'll, I'll speak about individuals in a bit. But that was the thing I wanted to see. Because remember this, Eric Ten Hag said this about um, United previously. This is when he took over. Um, he, didn't took, he didn't take over, but he stepped in to have more of a direct influence and control over the under-21s. Because he wanted... What Eric Ten Hag wants is a perfect um, path from, I don't know, under sixes, the whole way through our football club to the first team. That's what he wants, which we haven't had that connection. I don't think we've ever had that connection. I don't think you can confidently say that a, an academy side under Fergie played like Fergie. I suppose they would have used him as in inspiration, but Ten Hag's trying to make it like the identity of our club. And Travis Binion spoke about it after the game. Let me go over here and make sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah, man, I did. Jeez, look at that. Good morning to the best community in the world because it really, really is. Mark and Ned. Sounds like a tag team duo there. Mark and Ned gifting five memberships each. <laughs> Oi, apparently I've missed one gifted membership as well. The one For some reason, the one gifted membership never pops up. I'm a potato. I see you down there. It doesn't pop, up, doesn't pop up on my screen. I have to go back to the YouTube screen to see it. But le legends. Leroy, what are you saying? Do you think Wrexham could be a good step up team for, your, for the first team? What you mean in terms of loan spells? Well, you saw yesterday, it was basically men against boys. They were physical. Very, very physical. And they used the most of it. That was how they scored their goals. Both of their goals came from like attacks towards the back post. They, they used they used a weakness in our team and it worked. But this is what Travis Binion, who is the under-21s coach, this is what he said after the game about Ten Hag's involvement. He goes, look, Eric has been brilliant for us. It's been really insightful for the staff to spend three days with him. He couldn't have been any more welcoming, any more open. We were sat in the Real Madrid preparation, Arsenal debriefs, talked about Wrexham together. He was at training yesterday. And obviously, he has been really supportive. He has allowed us to get on with it. He has given his thoughts. It's been brilliant for our staff and players to have that experience over these last few days. Him and the staff gave us real clarity in what they are after. Did we achieve that? No, we've got a lot of work, but we'll get there. It's brilliant. We've got a manager who wants to see the identity flow through the club and we know what we've got to go for and to achieve. 
And that's Eric Ten Hag standing there. Now, you might say that was a bit of, um, I don't know, you might say it was a, I don't think it undermined Travis Binion, him being there, Ten Hag helping. It's it's Ten Hag trying to really make sure that this identity flows the whole way through the club. It's um it's something that was said about Ten Hag before he came in, right? That he's um he's a bit of an obs an obsessive in a good way. He's he's a meticulous man, loves his details, loves his planning. But this is the perfect example of that. Ten Hag's got Real Madrid the next day, but sod that, he's, he's made it and planned it. So he's got two games in two days with the under-21s and he's going to be at both. He's going to help Travis Binion. He's going to establish that pathway because United should be producing. I was thinking about this, Oscar, and I actually can't remember. Can you tell me the last defender from the academy who came through and really established himself in Manchester United's first team squad? Doesn't have to be a first team player, but first team squad. Obviously, you've got Rashford who's come through as, a, as an amazing talent. You've got Elanga who came through and has been sold to Forest, but he came through and established himself. You've got Garnacho, he's an attacker. You've got, um, I don't know, Kobe Mainu coming through. Do you see, you don't really see many defenders making that jump from academy the whole way through to the first team? Someone down there, Gary, you're talking about Johnny Evans going that far back. Is it really that far back? Yeah, it must just be like Twan Zebe you can talk about, but Twan Zebe was, it never really worked out for him. A few of you mentioned him, Wes Brown. I don't know. I was thinking about it. I was like, I can't actually, I cannot remember for the life of me, like a defender who's established himself after being in the first team. Stuart, thanks for your super chat, dude. You're saying this. Through all age levels, Ten Hag seems to be building a system that will pay dividends in the future. Uh, thanks very much, mate. Look, it's not just the best channel. I, I like to think it's the best channel, right? I'm, I'm, I'm biased, but I think it's the best community. It's genuinely everybody gets involved because online there's a load of crap, all right? There's so much just crap. But you all fire in genuine comments and interactions, and that's what makes it such a good show, I think, and such a good community. But yeah, the Ten, Hag is, Ten Hag is building something and hopefully builds it so strong that when he leaves, whoever comes in can just follow it on. Brandon Williams, that's, that's, a, that's a good shout. Brandon Williams is a fair shout. Uh, but still, even Brandon Williams, did he really establish himself as a first-team star? I don't know. Maybe maybe it's... Do you think it's more difficult because, because of how... I don't know. How physical it is you've got to be a defender? Less opportunities for mistakes as defenders? I don't know. Borthwick Jackson? Yeah. Not really. You could say the same thing about Paddy McNair or Donald Love. I don't know. I just can't remember. There's, there's not... Not, by the, not, not on the same level as Rashford, anyway. That's what I think. Um, I don't personally think Williams is good enough. Uh, otherwise, he would have stayed in the first team. But look, speaking of Johnny Evans, right? Let's speak about a few individuals for the game. We've, we've probably got about, let's call it 10 minutes now. We'll run through the whole show. You can The whole game yesterday, you can let me know and we'll have a conversation. But if Johnny, if, like, if yesterday was the sort of uh, audition for Johnny Evans, can he, can he do it? Uh, then the answer was no. Johnny Evans got pretty bullied yesterday. I don't know whether it was just because he was playing with the youth team, but they exposed clear weaknesses in good crosses to, towards like the deeper part of the box, back stick. Yeah. United's defence was uh, not strong yesterday at all. Two kind of, I wouldn't say sloppy goals. The first one was, it was, it was a good cross, but nobody was watching the man running through from the back post. Um, and it was easy. And then Nathan Bishop was absolutely stuck on his line. Absolutely stuck on his line, like four yards, just didn't move. Not even four yards, he was just on his line That's because the attacker, the attacker scored from four yards away. And the second goal was a Rory Delap long throw, flicked on, and then Hayden jumping at the back post above everyone else. It was, um, yeah. Johnny Evans is doing a job here, but don't expect Johnny Evans to sign a one-year contract. Uh, I don't particularly think he should. I, I can't judge it just off one performance, but you have to see how good a player he is right now. And right now, judging from that, not good enough is my response. But Nathan Bishop, of course, has taken... I'm not sure if you've seen. Um, there's been quite a few headlines. Nathan Bishop, right, the ball went over the top. Paul Mullen, of course, is Wrexham's main man. I think he's scored something like 76 goals in 92 appearances since he, um, since he joined Wrexham, which is just unreal. But he went out and it was... I wouldn't say it was... 
it probably was reckless. I mean, it was reckless. And it was massively mistimed. He ran out to try and get the ball. Paul Mullen touched it past him. And he absolutely walloped him. To the point, right, where Paul Mullen got a punctured lung. And I was like, I was like, what? I don't remember hearing about that injury much in football. That was some impact. Paul Mullen down for about five, six minutes. Um, had to have oxygen. And now you understand exactly why. So, yeah, genuinely wish him well. But the comments from um, Paul Parkinson, who is uh, Wrexham's manager, bit weird. Bit of a weird flex. Vincent, you sent a super chat, dude, there, but you haven't written a comment in. So just sending another comment and I'll try and read it out. This is what, uh, this is what the manager was saying, right? I'm fuming about it. I've got to be honest with you. It was clumsy, reckless, challenging a preseason game. I'm not happy about it. I haven't seen the goalie, and he's probably best steering clear of us for the time being because we're not very happy. Now, it's just it's just a bit of a weird flex to go after Nathan Bishop like that in public. First of all, he has apologized. Apparently, he went into the dressing room. That's what's being reported. He's also come out with a, a, a full apology as well. And it was just... Um, it's just, I don't know, it's a bit of a weird flex from uh, from Paul Parkinson to do that. But I have to admit, this was a red card, all right? This was absolutely a red card. And this was absolutely not a red card. I, I personally feel that the reason that the ref gets... So this, you can see the tackle here. Of course, it, as a screen grab, it doesn't show the full picture. Dan Gore's studs were up going into the into the challenge. He definitely came off worse in that it wasn't uh, it wasn't like studs up full power through like a malicious tackle. He kind of pulled out a little bit. Anyway, it certainly wasn't a red card. I personally think that the reason that the ref gave the red card is because he didn't give a red card for that. That should have been a red card. That shouldn't have been a red card. So kind of in that sense, the ref, the ref is thinking, right, well, they kind of cross each other out. I think United should have been down to 10 men, but it shouldn't have been Dan Gore that got sent off. And it was after that point in the game where United kind of, I don't know, we just didn't have it after that point, so, which is a real shame because we started the first half really well, were crap for about half an hour and then ended the half really well, got the goal. And the goal was great. It was Alvaro Fernandez, a lovely floaty cross into the back post and Mark Gerardo scoring at the back post, fullback to fullback, very Eric Ten Hag. But that wasn't a red card, right? Let me see what you're saying in the comments. Paulie, you're saying it's the ref making amends. Humphrey, you're saying that red was absolutely unnecessary. I do. I agree. It wasn't a red card. But I think Nathan Bishop's was. So that's why the ref is going to be like, all right, cool, yeah. Balance myself out there. Um, did it, did, did, did. Reaction of the Rex and players. In, no, it's sod that, man. No. no uh, you shouldn't get reds. Well, of course, you can get reds in friendlies. But come on. Come on. And it's a real shame for Gore because he was wearing the captain's armband. He was playing well. It was a real opportunity for him to impress Eric Ten Hag and it kind of got taken away from him. Which I kind of feel a little bit sorry for him. But that goal there, yeah, man. Alvaro Fernandez stood out. Hannibal stood out. And you shouldn't really be too surprised about that, right? The two lads who have been training with Manchester United's first team the whole way through, been in the preseason the whole way through, they're the two players who look a step above. It's because they are a step above. Alvaro Fernandez, for me, looks like he's got a more of an all-rounded game compared to Tyro Malasia. So I'll be interested to see what goes on there because I don't particularly think you can keep both of those happy at the same club at the same time as second choice. Ferdinand, you're saying Malasia is in trouble. I don't know whether he's in trouble, but um, Fernandez is too good to sit as Manchester United's third choice. I personally would love to see him get a Premier League loan. And I think I would put Hannibal in the exact same category. I think Fernandez and Hannibal, for me, look like they could handle a Premier League loan. Obviously, it's going to be somebody who's battling relegation. I just saw somebody mention Luton in the comments there. I think that sounds like a pretty good loan spell, really. Was it Tahith Chong's just moved there as well from Birmingham? Maybe maybe Hannibal can follow. I think both of them should be loaned out. Hannibal is the one I think you can have conversations about because if Man United 
sell Fred and we sell Van der Beek, then there might be a space inside that squad for Hannibal as one of those aggressive number eights. But of course, remember that Bruno Fernandes is never really going to come off the pitch. So you're only really going to replace one and Mason Mount. Maybe that isn't going to be enough for him. Now, what do you think? Do you think Hannibal should be kept or loaned? And if he does get loaned, where do you think he should get loaned to? And I, I think the Fernandez one's quite set up. And maybe the same same thing for both. Fernandez and Hannibal, what would you do? Keep them or loan them? Let me know in the comments. Um, DP is saying defensively as a whole, it was bad yesterday. Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, Wrexham had their, their physical and their height advantage and they used it. They played up to it. You know, I should have expected that and maybe planned a bit better. Steve Nussie joining there as a member, dude. Let me know where you're watching from. I'll try and give you a shout out. Um, da -da 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 -da. Vic, you're saying, I think Hannibal will get enough game time. Now we need two number eights. Um, Yi and Suraj, you're both saying keep. Devo, you're saying Premier League loan. Paul, you're agreeing on Facebook. Uh, Ronan, you're disagreeing. Keep them both. Keep them both. Keep the league games. Maybe this is, a good, I reckon this would be a good poll, right? Let's leave this as a poll for today, right? Ha I'm going to put them together. Hannibal and Fernandez. Keep or loan? Because right. I personally feel that they're both pretty much at the same position, same same position in the squad in the in in their respective positions. I think they will probably get the same amount of game time if they were both to stay at Manchester United. But I'm going to leave that poll up there, and someone remind me towards the end, and I'll go back and look at the results. Uh, but yeah, there you go. That was around about ten minutes there. Around about ten. Oh, look at that man, Jack Reynolds, your legend. Legend. Five gifted memberships. I don't, know what, I don't know how I'm so sprightly to sprightly today. Let's have a little bit of water first. I managed to get an hour nap in at seven. Come on. Let's talk about the main part of the show. Right? Hoyland and Amrabat. The Amrabat story is one that I've I've not been ignoring it, but you know full well that I won't be jumping on any random headline and say oh this is happening that is happening because i don't want to feed hysteria but there's a lot of um there's a lot of noise now around amrabat to the point where my lunchtime video today is going to be an amrabat full story going to take a look at how this whole transfer story has developed so far to the point where where is it at now that's what i'm going to cover in my video at lunch but let's speak about this this guy here first hoyland chris you're asking in the comments is hoyland really that good Hoyland, isn't a, Hoyland is, is a developing striker. He's 20. He's nowhere near the final product. Nowhere near. However, he's a hell of a prospect. And with the right coaching, in the right team, with his attributes, he does have the potential to be a fantastic player. Of course, potential is, well, it's not everything. United have had so many potential, so so many players with potential that just haven't fulfilled them. But obviously, this is what uh, Fabrizio Romano said about the Hoyland situation yesterday. He said, "Look, the terms are agreed. We already know that five-year deal. Told that it will include the option of a further year. United will bid this week. That's what everything has been saying. Every, we are still hearing that it should be by tomorrow. Let's find out. Maybe it's later today. That would be nice." not entertaining 90 to 100 million euro games. And we spoke about it yesterday about what we felt was the right price. What I'm going to do here is run through the latest. This is from Alfredo Padula from Sport Italia, as I say every time. He's been, he was pretty spot on throughout the whole Onana situation. So it's clear that his sources within Italy right now, when it comes to Manchester United, are pretty strong. This is what he is saying on the, on the Hoyland situation. He's saying, look, he wants United at all costs, right? He wants to move. Um, we said by Thursday that bid's going to get going in. Any time could be good. Based on our information, this is the interesting one here. Based on our information, the Manchester United will present a proposal not far from 70 million euros plus bonuses to get closer to 75 million euros. So 70 million euros is 60 million pounds. We ran through all the articles yesterday from Times and Telegraph saying that Manchester United's maximum bid will be 60 million pounds. That's the ceiling price. And here you got uh, the Italian press saying that 60 million will be that bid with an extra 5 million euros for bonuses. And I'll be totally honest, man. Those bonuses 
are so irrelevant if they're done correctly. Now, Mason Mounts. The only reason, man, so Man United signed him for £55 million, rising to 60 with bonuses. The only reason it reaches 60 is if we win the Premier League and we win the Champions League and he's involved in it. So therefore, you're more than happy to pay that five. At that point, you'll be throwing the money at them. Same thing goes here. If Man United's max is 60 mil, which is 70 million euros, and we add 5 million on, then just make sure that those 5 million are difficult add-ons, right? What do you think about that overall? The concept that Man United might be paying 75 million euros for Rasmus Hordens, which, of course, totals 64.3 uh, million pounds. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money on what is a prospect. Josh, you're saying it's a 75 mil gamble that we can't afford realistically. We will struggle to replace him if he doesn't work. Uh, well, I imagine we'd, we'd just have to shift him on quite quickly, which Man United wouldn't have previously done. We would have just held on to him for years and then sold him for pittance. Uh, we need Hoyland and Kane, says Suya. Wait, geez, that would be nice. Um, Scott, 50 mil plus McTominay and Maguire. Like they, we've already done the cash plus players and they've rejected all of it. They just want money. Alex, you're saying it's overpaying. Paula, too much. Say the jungle, it's ridiculous. Yeah, all of us are in the same boat. We all we all agree that it's too much money. Um, and you're you're more of a fan of Ramos, dude. There has been absolutely no noise around Ramos, which tells you that Eric Ten Hag doesn't feel his profile fits because he 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 is so available. He is so available, but clearly. Man United have done their homework here. And that's why Hoyland is top of our list and why someone like Gonzalo Ramos isn't. Which I'm, I'm surprised about, but Man United have done their homework here. Uh, Chris, you're saying, look, the problem is who else can you buy? Kane is not available. So without Hoyland or Colo, who can you actually get? Like we spoke about Ramos and Ramos would, Ramos would fall into the exact same category. Maybe not the exact same category. Right, he's proven himself at the World Cup. He's proven himself in the Champions League with Benfica. He's got a little bit more ex more experience than Hoyland. But still, it's still a risk. The only the only striker we could sign that wouldn't have a risk is Harry Kane. And you see that is you see this news overnight. <laughs> I don't actually think that Joe Lewis is in legal control of Spurs anymore. If I'm correct. Was this, is it, does it say it down here as well? Dip, 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 dip. No, it doesn't say it down there. I'm pretty sure that he's not actually in legal control of Spurs anymore, but it'd be interesting to see if that affects the club in any way, shape or form. Probably won't. Probably won't. Um, but I found that interesting. But yeah, look, I agree with all of you down there. Look, um, uh, Mike, you're saying, hang on, I said yesterday that we should get both and you slated me, Sam. Now you just said it's not... I never slated you. I would love to get both. Who wouldn't love to get Hoyland and Kane? I just said it's not going to happen because it won't happen. And the exact same thing applies there that applied yesterday and will apply tomorrow. It's, there's no chance in hell we sign both of them. I would love to. Who wouldn't want to sign both of them? Um, but look, let's move on to the conversation here, which is kind of like a supplementary conversation. It's, it's a conversation that will exist after we sign Hoyland. After we sell Fred, after maybe we sell Van der Beek, and maybe McTominay too. That's when the Amrabat conversation comes around, and that's why I said I've, I've sort of I've let the conversation flow in the background. But I feel like there's so much noise now coming out of Italy that I'm going to cover it, and that's what I'm going to do for today's lunchtime video. But this is what uh, Alfredo Padula is saying on actually no, this is what his agent said yesterday. He said, look, there's quite a few clubs interested in Amrabat. Now it's about making the right choice. He's open to a transfer, so is Fiorentina. There are two or three clubs he is open to. And this is what Alfredo Padula was saying. Look, his agent spoke of three, two or three offers, but Manchester United have pulled away from the competition. 23 to 25 million with bonuses. We spoke about that fee yesterday. But look, Amrabat has reached an agreement in principle on the salary. He's saying that Amrabat has agreed personal terms with Manchester United. And that's clearly... Is that the, someone who can let me know in the comments, right? Is that just how transfers go these days? 
because that used to be tapping up. And for United, it's a bit of a difference from how we operated last summer. We went after Frankie de Jong all summer long. No comment at any point about personal terms being agreed. In fact, I remember us agreeing a fee with the club. And that's when we thought, hey, this is going to happen. But it didn't. Whereas this summer, Mason Mount, Andre Onana, Hoyland, and now we're hearing about Amrabat, personal terms being agreed with all of them. Joris, I think you've absolutely nailed it with your comment there. You're looking at player power. Agents now are so powerful and players are so powerful that instead of having to agree a fee with the club first, you agree a fee with the agent first and the player first. And as I said, if Alfredo Paluda is indeed correct, then Man United have already got that agreement in place with Amrabat. Nothing to do with the price. Nothing to do with the deal being agreed. But Man United having a conversation with his agent, boom, yeah, how much? Yeah, cool. All right, sweet. Yeah, we'll accept that if you can get a deal done with Fiorentina. Right, okay, let's go to the let's go to the negotiations table. Ben, you're saying it makes the transfer go quicker. I would say it takes away a massive element of the risk of a transfer. Because if, if a club knows that a player wants to leave and a knows that a player will accept a contract, it gives that Man United and that buying club a little bit of power in the negotiations, isn't it? We know your player wants to join us. He's already told us. Let's agree a deal then. And maybe that's why Man United have been able to negotiate properly this summer. And that's just the way that transfers go these days. It certainly wasn't the case back in the day. And that's just not, oh, yeah, well, back in my day, it was better. It's not that I'm saying at all. It's just that football's kind of changed. And I think the comment there that was left about the rise of player agents and their power, I think this is kind of indicative of that. Um, <laughs> Toby, you need a deep sleep after this. <laughs> I can't. We've got the... I'll have a nap this afternoon. There you go. Like a baby. Naps. Adults should be adults should be allowed to nap. All right. Napping is great. Love napping. Anyone else love napping? Maybe it's me getting old. Um, did, 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 what are you saying? That's why I was confused when everyone was blaming Barca, including Sam, like they had accepted two offers for the young. They had accepted money. They that we agreed to fee with Barca 94. I don't know what that comment's about. I don't understand that. Johnny's saying agents and their fees are killing football. Um, well, haven't they just introduced new rules? I think agents now have to pass a test. There's a maximum of 10% commission for an agent on a transfer. I think they're trying to get control of it. I don't know whether they're going to be able to, but um, they're going to try. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Let me pull that bad boy out. You shouldn't have seen that. That's where, that's where all the secrets go. There's no secrets. What I wanted to say here quickly, halfway through the show, if I can, ladies and gents, please drop a like on the video. And if you haven't already, all right, please make sure you grab your raffle ticket. We've got four, five days left until the draw is made. Someone's winning £700 worth of holiday vouchers that they can use on whatever they want, right? Only £1 per ticket. It was Carl, was it Charlie or Carl? I think it was Charlie last month. He won the 50-inch 4K TV and a Bose soundbar. But look, I've also updated this board here. There's quite a lot. So I've got two new totals down there. That's how much we've spent. And that's roughly how much we've made through sales. You can figure out the net between them. I can't be bothered. What's that? Just under 80 million net, there or thereabouts. Um, I've put little, little, I don't know, magnets next to the players who could be leaving. Two magnets up there for the players we could be signing. Woo! There we go. Updated. All the mod cons. All the mod cons. But let's move on from speaking about, as I said, Alfredo Peduda is saying that Man United have got the personal terms with both Hoyland and Amrabat. That would be a cracking pair of signings. Really, really would. Uh, Siam, you're saying, what's the vote? There we go. That's a good one. Let me go back to this. Let me see what you think about Hannibal and Fernandez. Should we be keeping them or loaning them? That's quite a close little split. 58% of you say we should be loaning them and 42% of you are saying keep. I personally agree with the 58%. I th Hannibal is too good and he's at the, at the point of his career where playing time is how he's going to develop. I don't think he'll get that time at Manchester United as much as I think it would suit us as a football club. A bit like Donny van der Beek last year. You know, we blocked all the, loans, the loan moves for him. Because it helped us to have a little bit of backup. Never played, 
should have gone out on loan. Uh, loan with a fee, I think would be a good one. I personally think a Premier League club. Don't know who. Let's find out. But let's move on, of course, to the sales. The sales, the sales, the sales. So important this summer. And yesterday we got a big one. The biggest one so far. Anthony Alanga. His move to Nottingham Forest confirmed. And this was the message that he sent to Manchester United fans. Let's read through a little bit of this. Actually, no, let's not read through a little bit of that. You can read through it. There's too many, there's too, <laughs> too many words there. Too many words. But Anthony Alanga, man, I've I've got nothing bad to say about him at all. He broke through. I think it was Ragnick who really sort of took him under his wing because he very much followed the instructions, did exactly what his manager asked him to do and had that youthful exuberance in a season where we were desperate for it, man. We were desperate for some sort of spark. And he brought it. He didn't, in my opinion, quite have the um, technical capabilities at Manchester United. But I don't think you can question his attitude. Mate, he is a proper athlete he works hard he grafts hard i genuinely think that's going to be a pretty good signing for Nottingham forest i think that's going to for 15 million i think that's going to be a really good signing for Nottingham forest they just about survived last summer last season let's see if they can make it a little bit better this season but anthony langer wish him the absolute best until he plays man united and then i hope he plays absolute garbage but that was the announcement that's the video yesterday. Pull the video up. Here. That was the announcement video of him going to Nottingham Forest yesterday. Uh, and yeah, I wish him all the best, man. Also had a cracking chant there. Anthony Langer. That caught on for a little bit. Good luck to him. All right. Let me see what you're saying in the comments about him. Um, good luck, Elanga, says Scott. Uh, and you think we undersold him by 10 mil. I, f I felt 20 mil would have been a fair price. 15 mil, I'm not going to grumble about, but I still think that's under undervalued for the player he is and the, the experience he's got international. I've already explained all of this. City are out there selling players who haven't played a minute of senior football for 15 million. I think he should have been sold for more, but I'm still happy that he's gone, and that's a big, big sale. Now, we still need more, and i tell you what, If this happens, I will never, ever hear a bad word against West Ham ever again. West Ham, of course, trying to spend their Declan Rice money. Now, a couple of things to say about this. So first of all, let's read through the article first. James Ducker from The Telegraph saying that West Ham are plotting a move for McTominay and Man United are putting a £45 million price tag on him. West Ham are considering a move for McTominay, but we need to cough up around £45 million to sign him. Also interested in signing Maguire, but it would take 40 to 45 mil for McTominay and Sod knows how much from Maguire, quite a fair bit. United hope to raise as much as 20 mil by selling Fred. And again, you might you might scoff at these uh, price tags, right? 45 million for Scott McTominay, um, 20 million for Fred. And somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 million for Harry Maguire. Maguire absolutely is 30 to 40 million. Fred is absolutely 15 to 20 million. And in my opinion, McTominay is an absolute minimum of 30 million. Given his age, given his experience, his international experience, given the years he's still got ahead, he's easily a 30 million pound midfielder. So you might, you might, you might laugh at the fact that United are asked, might ask for 45 million. Look at what every other club is doing. This is the market that we exist in. I think 45 million is uh, huh, is ambitious. We'll call it ambitious. And if United go that high and then we kind of settle on 30, 35 million, I think we'll probably be happy, happy enough. But United here are just doing what every other football club is doing. How much is the most amount? 80 million. <laughs> All right. We sign it for 55. 45 million from the Tomine. 35, 30 million. Yeah, good. West Ham, genuinely, I'm not, I'm not just saying this because I just want to get rid of him, but he would be a good signing for, for West Ham. He's not, a, he's not a Declan... I suppose you could say he is kind of a Declan Rice replacement in the idea that he's a box-to-box -box midfielder. He's not a defensive midfielder. He's not a holding midfielder, a screening midfielder. He's somebody who likes to bring the ball up the pitch. Maybe not bring the ball, but 
move. He's better towards the edge of the opposition's box than he is his own box. Dave, you're saying, did you stay awake after the match or not? Add a, add a nap. And by the way, someone asked what the optimum time for a nap is. I think it's half an hour. Anything over half an hour, anything less than an hour, I suppose, is a nap. Anything over an hour, you're not napping. All right. But half an hour for me is optimum nappage. And you have to set an alarm because you think, oh, I'll just pop down for half an hour. You wake up five hours later going, oh, booger. It's happened again. <laughs> You're all saying 20 minutes down there. 20 minutes, half an hour. The ideal power nap time, I think. But yeah, look, West Ham, I will never hear a bad word against you again if you sign Scott McTominay for north of 30 million. Because I think Man United have the... If Man United sell McTominay and Fred and Van Der Beek and then we bring in Amrabat, maybe Maynou would then operate as more of a number eight. And then you'd have Casemiro and Amrabat as your two deeper midfielders and, and Maynou kind of dovetailing in as a number eight alternative with Mason Mount and Bruno. Something worth considering. But yeah, if you know I can get north 30 mil, I think we sell McTominay. And, and I think that'll be the good thing to do. Let me see what you're saying uh, in the comments. Um, di -di 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 -di. And you're trying to get into science about nap. I'm, I'm just talking about nap times, dude. I want to get into science when I'm talking about naps. I'm just talking about naps. Very simple. How many minutes? Thumbs up. Um, Freddie's 30. That's, yeah, I know I know that's why Fred is cheaper than McTominay. And he's only got one year left on his contract, I think. Um, Steven, I read a 38 plus five for McTominay was the West Ham offer. No, they haven't offered anything yet. But if we can get anywhere near 45 mil. Yes, please. Yes, please. Of course, there's more players who could and probably should be leaving. Um, that was Eric Bai on his Instagram account yesterday. Look, there you go. There's Eric Bai. Eric Bai on his Instagram account yesterday with a picture from Carrington with a done and a thumbs up. More than likely, he's just had a training session. Some might look into it and go, ah, oh, that's him emptying his locker. We've heard that Eric Bai has been linked with Saudi clubs mainly so far but nothing to this point has happened but Tellers has already completed his move to is it Al Nasser uh and I it's it strikes me that Eric Bai will follow him to the Saudi league um but there's no kind of word on that just yet all right but Eric Bai I, th I think we should be getting north of five mil for Eric Bai I really do man that he will definitely go down as one of those players recently that I'm most annoyed he got so injured. By by and Martial, two players that I think if they had just stayed fit would have been absolute demons for Manchester United. Really, really good players. Eric Bayer, remember when he came in and we didn't have a ball-playing, athletic, sort of fast centre-back and he came in and I was like, wow, man. Right at the start when we signed up from Villarreal. Real shame. But yeah, Bay and, and Martial are two players I'm most annoyed that just got their careers played by I mean, Axel Tuanzebe is a really good shout down there, man. I was so, I was so annoyed about that. Odi, optimal nappage. Should be a tattoo somewhere. Nick, thanks for Super Chat, dude. What are you saying? Rumour that uh, from a Sky Sports journalist that Suzuki has turned down United. Apparently, terms almost agreed, but turned down because of Nana signed. The United apparently trying to reconvince this week. I've seen other ones saying that, oh, he's turning down United because he wants to play in the Olympics. Really? You're going to turn it down and move to United because you want to play in the Olympics. Mm, okay. Um, let's find out. I don't know if there's like, I don't know, maybe there's issues going on in, I think the whole bloody Saudi league is getting banned from making signings now, isn't it? Because hmm, financial irregularities in this. No, no. I refuse to believe it. Refuse to believe it. But Eric Bay, of course, is another one that we hope to see leave. Now, this is the, I saw this uh, on Reddit, and this is about Matej Kovar. And Thomas Rizicki, who is the sports director, you know, general manager there. Do they have general managers in chat politics? Sod knows. Calling sporting director saying, look, we want Kovar, but if we can't bring him in, we're going to have to go and get another goalkeeper. I think they want Kovar, but clearly Man United are maybe are looking to... 
I imagine Man United are probably looking towards uh, a loan closer to home so they can track and follow his progress a little bit more closely. I don't know. Um, I thought he was just going to go back to Sparta Prague, but maybe we're going to see Matej Kovar going somewhere else. And look, Nathan Bishop was in the spotlight for what happened with Paul Mullins yesterday, but that may well be his last appearance in a Manchester United shirt. Scott Wilson, who writes for the, uh, is it the Northern Echo? Yeah, it is a Northern Echo. Chief sports, report, chief sports writer saying that Sunderland are going to be signing Nathan Bishop. And it sounds like it's going to be on a permanent deal as well. So once the tour is finished, Nathan Bishop will come back and he will leave to join Sunderland. So that may well be the last appearance from Nathan Bishop in a Manchester United shirt. And just more goalkeeper. You know the goalkeeper roulette I've been telling you about. Button leaving. Who was the other one? Butland left. Obviously, his loan ran out. De Gea left on a free. Dean Henderson's joining Forrest. Then we signed Onana. Then Kovar's probably going out on loan. Then Bishop is probably being sold. That's six goalkeepers. Maybe you might see someone like Suzuki sign. That'll be seven goalkeepers coming in or out of Manchester United in one summer. Here's some madness. Luke, you're saying, will Sunderland still want him after last night? Of course they will. That will not change a thing. Debravka, nah, that was, that was halfway through the season, man. That doesn't count. That's the only reason we had uh, Jack Butland in. But look, ah, and I say this with a big smile on my face. Don't know why I did that. Tonight, today, man, tomorrow morning. Jeez, what is it? It's like, the game's in like 13 hours, man. Ah. <sighs> Anyway, oh, Nana, this is a game that is worth staying up for, whereas the Wrexham game wasn't particularly. Tonight should be the debut of Andre Onana in a Manchester United shirt against Real Madrid as well. What a game to have it in. I'm so looking forward to it. I gave you my predicted 11 for the game, and this was it here. I hope that we were going to see Onana playing in goal with, of course, Martinez and Varane. I went Luke Shaw and Delo because I think that maybe this is going to be an opportunity for Diogo Delo there because he hasn't really had a chance here. But maybe it will be AWB. And it was been pointed out to me as well, of course, that Vinicius Jr. is going to be playing. So maybe that's exactly why he played Juan Bissaka. Um, I want to see Kobe Mainu start this game over Casemiro because we already know how good Casemiro is. Oh, look at that. That's really weird because that's a little bit of me on the side. That shoulder is connecting up perfectly and it makes it like we've got a mega shoulder. Don't like that. Let me just put that on there. That's better. Um, I'm hoping that we see Manu, Bruno and Mount because we already know how good Casemiro is. We don't need to see him against Real Madrid to loan that. I think there's more to see and learn from Manu here. Dominated in a midfield that had Rice, Odegaard and Havertz. How can he do in a midfield that might have Bellingham, Chiumene and Camavinga? Well, that's a bit of a step. That's a slight step up, you might say, in terms of midfield competition. That's what I want to see. Uh, and a front three of Rashford, Anthony, and uh, Sancho in the false nine. Anthony's been wasteful so far. Needs to improve. Um, but yeah, that's my starting 11. What do you think about the starting 11? Do you think there'll be any changes? And what would your prediction be? Let me know in the comments and we can run through that towards the end of the game. But yeah, tonight is all about this, man, isn't it? It's not all about this, man, but... The excitement has been building up towards it. And it really would be a fantastic game to get his first appearance in the United Shirt because I want to see him playing out from the back with the ball. I'm looking forward to it, man. I know there's going to be mistakes, but I cannot wait. Milk Music, you're saying Casemiro first half, Maynou second. Alex, you're saying, I think that might be too much too soon for Maynou, but surely that's what preseason is all about. Like, a mistake in preseason... If it leads to a draw or a goal, it means absolutely sweet FA. It's all about getting the understandings. You might you might have said that, oh, hold on. Starting Manu in front of 82,000 people against Arsenal might have been too much too soon. For me, Manu should start this game. If Ten Hag really does trust him that much. But maybe on the on the on the the only reason I wouldn't start him is if Casemiro wasn't would still need the minutes, more, more more minutes than I suppose he does, right? Needs the fitness in his legs. That's the only reason I'd start him. But from, an, from a temperament perspective, I think there's more to gain from watching Maynard than leaving on the side. Let me see what your 
predictions are in the comments. Stephen Lawrence, you're going for 2-2. Two, two. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, you better get some sleep or it's Return of the Zombies. I can feel my eyes starting to, starting to do that. Can I just do like a sleeping live stream? Can't really see your comments, though, so not really productive there. Uh, Syed, you're going for 2-2. Two, two. Rookie, you're going for 3-0. Rob, you're going for 3-3. Three, three. Um, did it, did it, did it. Anoti Daishi. You're going for 2-2. Two, two. I hope I did that. I hope I got your name right. Alex, you're going 2-2. Two, two. What was my prediction? Ugh, I can't remember. I think my prediction was 1-0. I think that's what it was. I don't care about the result. I care about the patterns of play tonight. Call me boring if you want. But I want to see the style of United. I want to see Onana in there. I want to see how Sancho gets on in that number nine position. False number nine. Uh, I've got my five things to look out for. That's going to be going out. Um, I'll put it on YouTube as well. Oh, should I? Maybe, maybe not. It will definitely go out on TikTok and Instagram. Uh, my five things to look out for. Majority of you are saying down there, the United win. We haven't conceded so far. Well, the first team hasn't conceded so far in the preseason, so I would absolutely take that. But the main story of today, from a transfer perspective, is this from Alfredo Padula, who... I've, I'll say it one more time because some people keep asking, who is he? Who is he? He work, works for Sport Italia out in Italy, and he was very hot on the news with Onana to United. He followed the story the whole way through quite well. So I'm giving him his stripes, and I'm following his information now on Amrabat and Hoyland because he was so accurate on the Onana stuff. Let's see if he follows through. He's saying that we've got personal terms agreed with both. The bid we've always heard should be going in by Thursday is Wednesday. It's my sister's birthday as well. I've just remembered. Come on. I knew I, I already bought her a card, but now I can remember that I've got a messenger. I won't get in trouble. Come on. That's that's worth dropping a like on the video for. <laughs> I'm definitely going to have a nap before the game today, though. Honestly, I don't know how international Reds do that. You must just hate football. You must just, you must just get in the way of everything you do. You must just permanently be tired because you're United. <laughs> Benny's saying you're lucky. Yeah, I'm a lucky man. Luckily, I looked at the date there and I've got it. Everyone's wishing happy birthday to my sister. I'll let her know that. She'll be delighted. But thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'll be back here with my lunchtime video. And then I'll be back here for the Real Madrid game with the match reaction. Thank you all for tuning in. And I'll see you soon. Best community in the world. You know that.